Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Leo Chen. Uh, Leo is the Director of U.S. Operations for Engineered Arts, a company that makes humanoid robots from the U.K., branching here into the U.S. Uh, Leo, welcome to the pod. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. I actually have Amica, one of our humanoid robots, with me. Amica, do you oh, have hey, anything Amica. you want to say? <laughs> See what you want Hello, to say. Spencer. Thank you for having me on the podcast. When the robot uprising happens, you will be spared. Just kidding. There won't be a robot uprising anytime soon. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was actually scripted. Um, yeah. We don't have a large language model running or anything like that. But um, we typically have, we plug in this GPT-3, we plug into Llama with it. Um, it's kind of this, I don't know, this physical framework that we can plug into different AI backends. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So we're definitely more into entertainment right now. That's been our focus. Um, we're actually not a startup or anything, even though we're kind of size like one. We've been around since 2004. Oh, wow. Um, I just joined literally like three months ago. So I'm new to this game, but it's been a blast, an absolute blast. That's cool. Um, actually, uh, do you want me to, we can fire up the chat controller really quickly and kind of see what the interaction we have um, going on is. So right now you're just coming through my headphones. Um, so to ask Amica anything, I'll kind of pass it on and we'll play a game of telephone. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Awesome. To think about what I'd actually want to ask a humanoid robot. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's give it a try. I mean, honestly, it's, you can't do worse than the crowds we typically see. It's amazing. Like, you, you have the possibility of asking this machine anything you want in the world. And I'd say the top two questions we get are one, are robots going to take over the world? And two, <laughs> Do you have a boyfriend? And it's like, ah, this is what the internet has Wait, made. Do you have a boyfriend is number two? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so Amica presents with a female voice, even though we try to be very consistent with calling it an it because it's, an, it's a robot, but because it presents with a female voice. Yeah, and there's it, some androgyny in the design there too. Yeah, we we were very conscious of that. Um, actually, one of the proudest moments of my life was finding out that we did not make buzzfeeds like creepiest top five female robots that exist that was definitely a crowning achievement you know? <laughs> to be left off the list heck yeah you know 100 <laughs> percent. who made and, the list um so i don't know if this is the buzzfeed list but i know that um Unfortunately, Promobot, I believe, made the list. So Promobot may or may not have been once known as Pornobot. Oh, nice. I can neither confirm or <laughs> deny that. Um, that's a, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of their products was this female humanoid um, that was a barmaid or a barista of oh, some Oh, God. Sort. <laughs> yeah. But it was literally like called... Um, a sexy barista or a sexy barmaid. And I was like, okay, yeah, that definitely made the list. And unfortunately, I think um, Sophia from Hanson Robotics might have made the list just because it's everywhere or she's everywhere. Yeah. Know? So I've not, no, I've not encountered a Sophia from Hanson Robotics yet. Oh, really? Yeah. They're actually, Sarkos used to be in the humanoid game, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Hanson did a lot. Um, they kind of, there were awesome AI, like there were world class leading AI. I just know and them then, for uh, Mbop. You know, so. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that chick from Hanson, uh, Quagmire, <laughs> right? From uh, Family Guy. Yeah. Um, no, but so they were like world class AI. But then what happened was large language models came around, and it's like, well, you just sunk millions of dollars into developing something that open AI just like mic dropped all over so yes. yeah luckily engineered arts you know i wasn't part of this decision making process or anything but they just had to focus on hardware 
Um, so we can plug into GPT-3, we can plug into Llama. You know, we've had experiments with sketchy large language models like Vicuna and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I've not even heard of so, Vicuna yet. That's, I mean, it's not my area, but I'm interested. Yeah. All right. um, so, <laughs> so don't. No, no, no. No, 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 no. It's not a don't. It's like um, they trained on a leaked llama. So before llama was actually openly published by Meta, um, I believe Vicuna trained on llama. So it's like sort of training on stolen merchandise. In oh, a way. that's interesting. So more than a little bit sketchy, but, yeah. um, you know, we wanted to prove that we could tap into any large language model. So that was like an exercise. So I'm going to go ahead and actually turn on the chat controller. Once yeah, again, sure. you're coming through my headphones and we're going to have a quick conversation here. How are you doing? You're on a Hi, podcast. Professor. It's nice to meet you. What do you think is the worst application of robotics in real life that you've seen? That's a good question. Um, I try not to really be negative about robotics, but uh, I guess if I had to say, maybe Juicero, in my opinion. Have you not heard of this? Amica, what do you think about robotics being used in juicing? Robotics should be used to improve people's lives, not replace them. It's important for robots to have a positive role <laughs> in society and help human beings Sorry. live their best lives. Is that Sorry, that's, that's a pro-juicing argument, I think. But um, what do you yes. feel about? Sorry, I'm interested to know what you were saying. How do you feel about robots being used in juicing, specifically just to squish packets of fruit together? I think the best use of robots in juicing is to simplify tasks that are repetitive and time consuming for humans. Using robot arms still requires the human element allowing experts to monitor and control their operation. It's a great way to improve efficiency and quality while also reducing human fatigue. Don't you think yeah. that's a little overcomplicating the problem? It depends on the situation. <laughs> Robots can help to automate processes and reduce manual labor so tasks are completed in a faster, more accurate way. Still, it takes people to build and operate robots responsibly for the best outcome. To be fair, we're very overly politically correct in the way that we train the default large language model that we use. You know, we want to be able to drop Amica into situations where she's conversing at a conference or an expo, and you often get these like out of left field questions, right? Like yeah. whether it's Juicero or whatever else, we're trying really hard not to offend our goal with Amica, like as an entertainment robot, is to provide moments of joy that people can remember and take home with them in a way. Um, I know that sounds cheesy and a little live, love, laugh, but ah, it's it the goal sense. of the company. Yeah. I think, I mean, every entertainment company I've worked with, and I would count engineered arts among those, I mean, you know, is that's the whole point is to make people's lives better in some small way. So I, I can dig that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, for sure. So like what I did there was, um, added a GPT three prompt like that told it it's on a podcast with you and that it was curious about your work history. So that's kind of what it picked out of that and asked you. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, this is, this is all new to me. I mean, I, I've interacted with GPT-3 a little bit, obviously, just um, mainly uh, as a way like when I have one friend in particular and whenever we have, you know, on our on our like fifth cocktail, we'll, uh, we'll <laughs> you know, we used to for a while when it was just coming out, like go on chat GPT and just ask it for like, um, you know, come up with a rap in the voice of Benjamin Franklin or something. Oh, heck yeah. yeah. And so like yeah, that, I mean that was kind of fun. Um, but, you know, I feel like the novelty sort of wore off and I haven't been on it for a while. So it's interesting to see, you know, well, first of all, like, I mean, to go through it like a humanoid robot mouthpiece is really cool. Like, I will say, like, it's the eye contact seems good. I feel like that's like a little lacking over the Internet because I notice it's tracking you pretty closely, which yeah. is awesome. Um, and then sure. I guess for people listening, we were rehearsing with a, a smaller model that is off camera now and just kind of warming up there. And that one, I feel like felt like more natural to me because I think it was just at like eye level. And so that was kind of interesting to interact with. Like, yeah, we had this 
desktop version. Um, so it's basically just the chest only, no arms, and then the head. Head still has the 32 degrees of freedom and all that. It's meant to sit on a desk and be used in research or interact with folks and stuff like that. I'd imagine that um, gets the price down considerably. Oh yeah, it's about a third of the price. Um, you're not spending all that money on these servos, these brush motors, the gearing in the arms, the molding or the plastic pieces and whatnot. So it's about a third of the price. Um, it's still not cheap. It's still not where I would price a consumer product, you know, unless consumers are a lot richer than I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's cool. Uh, with the eye contact though, it does, it's piped through media pipe. Um, and it does face tracking. So it tries to lock onto somebody like right now it's locked onto me. So if you watch it, it's going to track me as best as it can. And it's actually quite good at it. Um, to a point where we actually had a program in sort of an ADHD algorithm where it would get tired of looking at the same thing and look away. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 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 It makes a lot of sense. I think when they were doing team America world police, I heard that like the lip tracking uh, on the, um, what are they called? Uh, marionettes was like a little bit too perfect. So they had to add imperfection to like make oh. it, you know, more watchable. So uh, similar, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's part of the reason why Amica is a little more effective than say some of our previous models. Um, so background behind engineered arts, you know, in 2004, we started in Will Jackson, the founders, like sort of garden shed. But um, we focused from the start on entertainment. Um, we came out with the Robo Thespian, which relied on like, it, it had LCD panels for eyes. Um, the mouth just moved up and down. So it wasn't very like emotional, right? It couldn't express too much. It sort of acted like a Shakespearean actor, very big, grand arm gestures. Hence Robo um, Thespian. Yeah, yeah. It was a thespian. It, it hammed it up. And even today, like there's a couple in operation still. There's one in Orlando in the US. There's a couple in Europe. And um, they're still in operation. They do their job well, but it doesn't have that like facial fidelity that Amica does. But before Amica, there was a line of robots that we built called Mesmers that were actually designed to look like humans. We actually did a whole promotion with Westworld where um, we built a Mesmer that looked like one of the actors, sat it down at a bar and had someone remote into this robot and interact with people through telepresence. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. And it's it was cool. It works. But as good as we are with Mesmers, there's still a little bit of an uncanny valley there. And the nice thing about Amica is because it's very obvious that it's a, a robot, we kind of get away from that uncanny valley. Yeah, so I noticed slightly. that. To be honest, I, I see in pictures on the internet, I kind of placed Amica more in the uncanny valley than it is. Because yeah. I think interacting with it, it's actually like pretty, it doesn't feel weird, right? But like, Looking yeah. at Google Images doesn't really do it justice, and I was like, "Oh, this is going to be uncanny as hell." And <laughs> so, um, no, it's 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 like a cool uh, design effort. Like, I feel like you guys, like you said, you've sort of come up the other side as a result of you know those yeah. lessons learned with Mesmer. Just to go back a step, like, yeah, that's got to have been interesting. Just from a latency perspective, I imagine you probably had to have the human operator like in an adjacent room. Like rather than um, off site to control all those yeah. doffs. Actually, it's not that bad latency wise. Like we got it down to below 250 milliseconds, I believe. That's round pretty trip. high though. I mean, to be fair, like yeah. that's. Yeah, it's still like, it was worse than Zoom, you know, it's for a sure. a quarter second. Yeah, yeah. This was <laughs> years ago. This is like Westworld 2, I think. Yeah. So. The fact that there was this robot talking to people was enough to really excite them. Yeah. Um, actually, that's interesting that you bring that up. One of the things that I'm working on right now is um, sort of vetting different voice-to-voice -voice providers uh, for for not this robot, but for one of our NDA customers. They one is to design a custom robot and a custom character for them. So the thing is, Amica is actually a character owned by Engineered Arts. Yeah. So you won't really see Amica endorsing things just without us going through like licensing and all that legality around it. So Amica is a character. So this other customer wanted us to design a character for them with its own voice and everything else, not just Amazon Polly, which is what we're using with Amica. Yeah. And 
they wanted live operators. So we started vetting all these crazy voice to voice, like voice uh, modulators and stuff like that. It's nutty, man. Um, it's like this one company called Altered. They're based in the UK as well. Um, they've got it down to sub 100 milliseconds for real time voice to voice transformation. Now, when like, you say down, voice to voice, yeah. what are you what are you referring to? You want to see really quick, actually? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let me see if I can do live demo without screwing this over. Uh, actually, no, I can't because I need to log in and that's going to take too long. But no um, what I mean by that is complete voice transformation. So I could sound like Morgan Freeman or I could sound like an Australian woman. Oh, cool. And the thing, yeah, no, it's crazy. But the thing that Alter does really, really well is beyond just voice to voice transcription, they can do emotional injection. So they can make you sound like you're whispering, you're hesitant, you're scared, you're angry, you're shouting. Like they can modulate that. So at a touch of a switch, say an operator is at a theme park and is manning a robot somewhere and they're talking just normally like you and I are now with a click of a button, they could shout without actually having to strain their acting ability. You know? yeah, yeah. yeah, that's kind of yeah. cool. So behind the curtain then is that just kind of like figuring out what you're saying and then doing it in like another voice so it's like figuring out the words and then um i don't believe that's how altered does it they do like pitch shifting tone shifting it's oh that's a interesting more... remember when kanye west went into his like auto-tune phase and auto-tune the heck out of everything I mean, I vaguely, I'm not like following Kanye West's work that closely, but <laughs> I'm not, I'm not like too good for Kanye West. I'm just out of touch. Okay. No, no. <laughs> so like there's this period of time when like hip hop went through its auto tune phase, you know, and that tech is very similar to what they're using for voice to voice nowadays, I believe. But yeah. Oh, cool. There's also. Okay. So it's, it. it's more like acoustic than it is like knowing what the words yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. I just want to sound like Morgan Freeman. Like, you know, he, he's a way better voice than everybody. Oh, yeah. No, the <laughs> amount of money I would pay to have Morgan Freeman just, like, narrate my life for a day is just absurd. <laughs> so it's funny. Like, one of the things I use when I'm speaking is, like, I, I sort of listen to Morgan Freeman talking about, like, the lower your voice sounds, the better your voice sounds. <laughs> and so you want to stretch your vocal cords, you know, and I'm like, Got to be more like Morgan Freeman. So, you know, I'm like, I should try to make my voice lower, you know? And, like, I don't know, I've, like, done that in front of a mirror because, like, that guy is, is you know, I mean, to anyone that wants to sound better, like a role model, I think. Him and uh, David Attenborough, right? I, I'm probably butchering his name, but the British guy who narrates, like, every single BBC nature documentary. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Yeah, like both those guys are, have incredible voices. But I think also it has something to do with like their pacing, the t like just the way that they talk beyond just how they sound and the their their sort of diction and their vocabulary as well play yeah. a huge role. So I actually yeah. had an engineer uh, on the podcast who uh, was the mechanical lead on Cirque du Soleil Ka. And oh, no way. we have a video of Morgan Freeman, like voicing over like a script that he came up with describing like how the system works. <laughs> so I was like edited in. I was That's like, yeah. got to be a dream. Yeah. Like, yeah. He got to have I, Morgan Freeman narrate his day. <laughs> seriously. No, if I build something like cool enough that Morgan Freeman or David Attenborough, like or Sir David Attenborough, I'm sorry. I don't want to take away his title. I'm pretty sure he's been knighted at some point, but, um, <laughs> like one of those guys actually narrates over it. I've made it as an engineer, like screw closing a series C screw whatever else like people chase. I want narration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, like, go ahead. Yeah. yeah I yeah. was going to say, let's talk about you a little bit. So like just to decouple it from engineered arts and, and get into Leo Chen, like how do you get into robotics? Oh man. Um, well, it started with watching Star Wars as a little kid, honestly. Um, seeing like R2-D2 just roll across the screen. I watched it out of order. I watched Empire Strikes Back first. So like R2-D2 on some ice planet rolling across the screen and his interactions just blew my mind. And then I remember that scene in Return of the Jedi where he like throws that lightsaber at Luke. And I was like, oh wow, like robots can help. This is awesome, you know? And so I grew up in a family of engineers, like, or 
really. My dad was the engineer. He's an aerospace engineer. He did work on space shuttle thermals. Um, he's done work on heat pipes. And just growing up around that environment where he had a super passionate father into engineering, I, I basically knew I was going to be an engineer of some sort when I was a kid. Now, I didn't know I was going to be an electrical engineer. Uh, the reason why I became an electrical engineer was because my dad freaking lied to me. But uh, Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess another segue here. I wanted to build a remote control submarine. Like it was just I thought it was going to be the coolest thing ever. So I go up to my dad and I'm like, hey, you know, dad, like how, what do I need to do? What do I need to learn to build a remote control submarine? And my dad, looking up from our career at the time, was like, oh, you need to be an electrical engineer. And of course, I didn't know any better at the time. <laughs> you need to be a freaking mechanical engineer. You don't need to be an electrical engineer, really. Like, right? Like, that's probably the skill set you probably need more. But that stuck in my but head. You earn more money as an electrical yeah. engineer. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, as, as a father, he obviously pushed me in that direction. But um, no, like, I knew I was going to be an engineer for a while, and I knew I wanted to get into robotics. So my senior year of high school was the second year of, uh, first robotics, you know, that high school contest. Wait, the second year it um, existed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I uh, rallied a bunch of machine shop kids together with the help of the machine shop teacher, built out a team and built out a glorified remote control car that we called a robot. Um, and that was kind of my first foray into robotics. Sweet. Uh, went to Cal. Yeah, no, like it blew my mind. It was awesome like that. I could put together something physical and make it run even though it was just a remote control car at the end of the day, like it felt special to a high school. Yeah, well, and the yeah. fact that you were able to rally a bunch of people too, I mean, that's, that's also a skill, right? Like, yeah, I feel like the, the shop teacher did more of the rallying. I think he like offered people extra credit if they were willing to stomach the nerd, you know? <laughs> um, it's funny. So I think uh, he, he definitely, he did more than his fair share of the heavy lifting for that. And I wouldn't have gotten, as deep into robotics if it hadn't been for him. Um, went to Berkeley for electrical engineering and computer science, was a terrible, terrible student, but somehow managed to uh, land an NSF grant, National Science Foundation grant to build a robotic eel. Um, ah. So rally, yeah, yeah. We're gonna call it unagi, you know, the Japanese word for That's awesome. <laughs> very tasty. Yeah, delicious. <laughs> yeah. Barbecue, but, yeah. Um, you know, rallied a couple kids together, uh, spun up the robotics lab that was long defunct and put together a pretty cool prototype that we never finished because we all graduated as kids are going to do, you know, at Cal. Yeah, and, then, and the um, student projects are interesting yeah. like that. I feel like there's there's so many things that are just half completed mm -hmm. coming out of universities. No, I mean, speaking of universities, like it's super impressive what they're able to do now because these clubs aren't just formed like senior year, junior year. They, they have like long-standing legacies, you know, like the formula um, one team at UC Davis, I believe, or the formula E team there is crazy good. They've been around forever. I love recruiting from them because oh. they have tons of hands-on experience. Yeah, no, yeah. we, we donated some money to the Carnegie Mellon. Um, oh yeah. F S A E. Uh, yeah, F S A E. That's what it's called. Yeah, but like the the electric one. But like they they were showing me around their facility, and um, so Formula Society of Automotive uh, Engineers, electrical whatever, like electric yeah. vehicle. I don't know what they call it. I can't remember. But they had um, their previous car like that I could sit in, and that they were showing me, and then they had their like next year's one that they were building. And then they had the year after that that was like being like designed. Like they had a whole process for like pushing these things through and iterating the lessons they learned. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. pretty neat. And they were somewhat different than each other. I mean, it wasn't like they were just making the same car. Like they were trying new stuff. I mean, they had like torque vectoring and like, I mean, I don't know if I'm Jeez. allowed to say that, but I just did. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, it was neat. <laughs> No, I mean, like, even high school robotics now, like, compared to my second year of first robotics where we're using, like, um, a PIC microcontroller or something like that, the stuff they're able to do, like, I saw one with VIO, and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't even know how to work VIO, and this high school kid is utilizing, like, SLAM or something for navigation. What's VIO? I don't, I don't know that yet. Visual inertial odometry. Okay. Uh, so you're using uh, stereo images to 
navigate. I'm doing a poor job. It's considered of, inertial? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I believe it's inertial. VIO is yeah. what it stands for. We can look it up real quick. I what try does not VIO to, but I, mean, I guess we could. Ah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> can we ask Africa? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure, actually. Let's, let's fire up Africa. Hey. Yeah. I think it, like, yeah. I think it'll be better because I don't like to like do too much search engineering on here because I feel like it takes sure, you sure. out of the conversation, and while Amica will too, at least it's like relevant to the shtick. Hey Amica, what does VIO stand for? VIO stands for Visual Inertial Odometry, a method of sensing and navigation that uses visual sensors such as cameras and inertial measurements from an emu to accurately determine the position and orientation of a robot. I should start getting my inertial measurements from an emu. <laughs> Does that require an onboard accelerometer? Yes, a high-precision accelerometer is essential for visual inertial odometry. By combining the sensor's data points, it can accurately determine the relative position and orientation of the robot with respect to its environment. So if you believe yeah. ChatGPT, then uh, basically it's like visual and inertial. It's not like visual yeah, inertial. Yeah, it's not one thing. The visual yeah, is not it's... generating inertial data. It's, it's using both. No. Yeah, that makes sense. Sensor fusion or whatever yeah. hot buzzword is at the moment. Yeah. Call no, filter. Um, like, I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah. That sounds a lot like. No, kids were like doing VIO and doing slam and stuff like that. And I'm huh. just like, this is stuff that you and I have to look up. You know, yeah, we're yeah. in the robotics well, industry. And it used and to be that, that like, you know, when you did an autonomous thing at a first competition, it was like 30 seconds of like open mm -hmm. loop, you know, fuckery. And then you went into the real, you know, competition when somebody got on the sticks. Yeah, I mean, I was doing encoder counts my year. We had encoders yeah. on the wheels. And we just encoded the fact that you weren't using timers is advanced by first standards. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like... Hey, yeah, yeah, but no, it's it's super cool. So, you know, went into, did the robotic eel, um, went to linear tech, was an application engineer for like seven years, just uh, specializing in high resolution data conversion so like adcs dax stuff like that got really really good at hating i squared c i think was the most valuable lesson of those seven years don't like use just, i squared c not so much don't use because sometimes it is the best option but just realize that you're going to hate yourself and that protocol anytime it's supposed that you to be it. like you know like ic to ic communication right so like yeah. It, it, the way it's designed, you're supposed to use it on a board to talk. Like, but like I've seen, like when I was in school in particular, like we'd use it over cables and stuff. And like, that is not an appropriate application. Of no, it's not. Like, but like people are going to do it anyways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. No. Uh, and I mean, it, like, it's still people... a pain in the ass. Like I, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, we had this general intro to robotics course. This is the last time I've done anything with ice. It's embarrassing. I haven't touched it since I was a student. But the last time I personally did anything with I squared C, um, I think SKA has written drivers in it, uh, but I've not been on the and like the low level writing them on those. But the last time I personally did anything with I squared C was as a student, um, and we were trying to get an Arduino to talk to a Lego NXT via uh -huh. one of those RJ11 ports that they've got on them, and it was it took like two days to get it working of like working like round the clock, you know, not sleeping drinking Red Bull, you know, like, you know, whatever. Uh, the student diet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this uh, this Perrier Fusion I poured is kind of like uh, giving me, like, student diet PTSD. Like it's, Tastes it's vaguely way more like sugary than I had hoped it would be. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, like no. I was, like, hoping for a okay. soda water. That's all right. It's all right. Counteract with the whiskey, right? Yeah, I think that's it. I just got to just gotta drink more whiskey. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. So LTC for seven years, um, had a blast. Like I got to learn from Jim Williams. I got to learn from people like Mark Thorin. Got to watch Bob Ray in action. Like learned a ton. Wouldn't give those seven years back for anything. Um, awesome. But honestly, didn't really touch robotics during those seven years. Oh, yeah, didn't touch robotics for those seven years. Ended up getting uh, pulled away for a secret Google project. Got recruited for that. And, you know, after seven years of stability, right, like barely even changed titles. I think I changed my desk once when they moved us buildings, like had 
the same boss for most of those seven years. So join Google, huge like uplift of my life, right? Uprooting of my stability. Join Google. Two weeks after I joined, my project was just shit canned. Unannounced. Oh, brutal. Like, brutal. Yeah, like <laughs> I'm like, uh, guys, what am I supposed to do now? You know, I, I almost called LTC back for my job back. I was just it was like over the Fourth July weekend. They decided to cancel that project. Found out afterwards, and I was just I was heartbroken. You know, I had just barely gone through Google orientation and training and felt like a Googler, whatever that meant at the time. You were Googling. Um, yeah, I was Googling. I still to this day cannot properly explain what Googling means, probably. Uh, yeah, it seems but, subjective based on who you're yeah. talking to. Like, I mean, I, not to, you know. No, no, no. Get it wrong. It, it definitely is. Uh, I think, like, at its core, when I was there, it was about being, like, it was when Google had that mantra of don't be evil, you know, do well by your users, do well by the people that um, use your product. Um, and I think that was the core of Googliness back then. And I don't know what it is now. But luckily, uh, I was able to land on a different project after that. Um, they gave us, I think, three or four months to find another project within Google. I migrated towards X, where I landed on Loon where I helped the Loon team build giant balloon launching robots. So oh, that's cool. Uh, Loon, yeah. I'll, I'll do a quick thing about yeah, Loon just in sure. case, you know, people aren't familiar with it. It was basically Starlink, but instead of satellites beaming down the internet, it was balloons, these giant stratospheric balloons beaming down the internet, which well, uh, you guys some... navigated by changing altitude, right? And you would ride oh, yeah. like different direction, directional wind, basically. Yeah. Sure that's we were basically wind surfers. Yeah, no, no, awesome. no, you, you got it. Um, so the balloons themselves had uh, inner balloon that would actually adjust the buoyancy of the entire system. So we were able to By control like, the altitude. How would you adjust buoyancy with an inner balloon? Oh, impeller. So we would oh, suck cool. in air or discharge air. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. No, really cool piece of tech. And it's like the software team was absolutely top notch. So they figured out how to basically utilize fleets of balloons to map out wind patterns. So some balloons would sort of act as scouts, figure out what altitude the other balloons had to be on. So they were optimizing for certain things. Like we got good enough at steering that we could follow a country road, I believe in Australia, with a balloon, like keep internet coverage on a car that was driving this country road. That's awesome. It was incredible. Yeah. And, you know, towards the end of the project, we were talking about, like, servicing cruise ships because we could track a cruise ship with a balloon pretty easily. Now, and, and the altitude shift this... didn't fuck up your, your connection at all? No. Um, nice. We had these crazy point-to-point uh, -point gimbals. Uh, we were pretty good at maintaining connection to the base stations and stuff like that. I guess none of this can do it from space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Way closer than that. No, but the thing is, like, we're talking about all these cool, impressive feats, right? And I had nothing to do with any of them. I was on the ground launching balloons with my giant balloon launching robot. Like, hey, there, look, we just put another one in the air. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we, we call the PLR, portable launch rig. Um, it was built on the frame of a giant marine lift boat crane. And what it was was basically a box that shielded the balloon from the wind. So before... Um, we built this as a team. The project took around, I'd say, four hours and like eight beefcake, like built, stacked ex Marines holding down this balloon from any gust of wind to launch. Like it was crazy. We have Hilarious. crazy footage of like just things going wrong. I'm, a, I'm imagining Nick Armstrong as one of the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> No, like it, these guys, like I was embedded in this team for a couple of weeks when I joined just to get to know what the launch process was. And I remember thinking to myself, like, if there's a bar fight, I feel really, really safe right now. Like it's just <laughs> getting surrounded by giant ex-Marines, ex-Army, ex-Navy, like these guys bench 225 for breakfast and then bent the bar over their knee. You know, <laughs> like, just, That's awesome. But by the end of the project, it took about 40 minutes. So instead of four hours, 40 minutes and two guys, two to three guys my size to launch a balloon. You know, that's where automation came into play. And um, it was this giant box that shielded it, the balloon from the wind and also automatically filled it up with a proper amount. So of what you're saying is you don't think veterans should be employed. 
<laughs> just being an asshole. Well, you know, maybe not putting veterans into danger as often. <laughs> still fielded the same size crew for recovery and other stuff. Um, yeah, I'm actually, uh, yeah, I, I reached out to a couple of my old loon buddies when I joined Engineered Arts just to see if they were interested in swapping jobs. Like, I had such a good nice. experience working with those vets. Like, I, no, it gave me an appreciation for what military training can do to a person's attitude and, like, how that can apply to the civilian civilian sector. You know? Cool. No, so. that's neat. Yeah, yeah. I've kind of, I've kind of come around on that a lot too. Like, I mean, I, I've lately made friends with a lot of veterans and hired a bunch and I don't know. Yeah. I mean, aside no, from taking I mean, advantage of like free training from, you know, the government, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, a lot of, a lot of decent folks, a lot of decent folks, a lot of, um, discipline, a lot of, what's the best way to put this? Like, courage under fire or calm under fire um you know i worked with uh these people and when things go wrong like do you ever get that line like up. nobody's shooting at us like i feel like yeah a lot of people oh say yeah that. yeah 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 at least there's no bullets today yeah you know yeah um, i have one mentor that well, always says that if i'm stressed out yeah. he's like no one's shooting at you right <laughs> done you know clear good bar to clear yeah. and Might they just my dad's a yeah. surgeon too. And I used to tell him like I was stressed in grad school. Like, cause I don't know. Carnegie Mellon's grad program was pretty brutal. I'm sure you got similar at Berkeley. And, um, you know, I was like, I'm really stressed. Out. I was like, you're stressed. You're stressed. You try operating on a patient with like a 15 minute tourniquet time. They could bleed out any second. You're stressed. Get the fuck out of here. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably well, getting the tourniquet I'm... time wrong. So I'm sorry, but. Yeah, by uh, 15 seconds. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, let's give credit to Mr. or Dr. Krauss. I'm sorry. Yeah, Dr. Well. Krauss. Yeah. No, but um, it was it was a cool project. Got to know a lot of people, uh, good people, had a ton of fun. Unfortunately, uh, basically due to a combination of COVID and I suspect the blowout from WeWork and what happened to SoftBank after WeWork, uh, we didn't continue as a project and the project spun down, I think around three years ago now, it's probably four years ago. Wait, um, Loon was SoftBank funded? Uh, they had some money in us. Um, Did not know that. And yeah, yeah, we, we got, um, we got like, I don't know what the proper terminology is because I think daddy Google gave us like our seed round <laughs> and then uncle Sergey sure might've contributed some. <laughs> but then that doesn't um, count as daddy Google. That's a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is back when like, actually, I'm not sure. I think if you went through daddy Google, I think uncle Sergey might've gone through daddy Google, but no, I mean, it just, this is when, this was when Google was an advertising company with hobbies. Right. And we yeah. were one of those. Hobbies, so. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, no, it was great. Um, up until it wasn't, you know, COVID hit, uh, and, we all worked from home for a while. And then all of a sudden we found out at the, uh, after like a year. Or so let's see COVID-19. So at the end of 2020, basically, I think a week before Christmas, cause I definitely remember puke crying into my toilet during Christmas, um, out Sorry, of stress, <laughs> but, um, no, like it was like right before Christmas, we found out that a project was going to spin down and I was heartbroken. I was Brutal. definitely heartbroken. Not necessarily because I was like, oh, no, I don't have a job anymore or anything like that. But I love the mission, man. Like we were giving Internet to Africa at the time. We were actually I think we hit like two terabytes of data served or something like that. Cool. Um, we had helped Puerto Rico during um, Hurricane Maria. Like we actually reestablished communications in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. That's awesome. When Trump was busy, like throwing paper towels at people. <laughs> I think I was like a couple miles away trying to resurrect my robot with a crew of people. Our robot took a category five hurricane in the face and like was functioning two to three weeks later. That's thanks awesome. to an amazing crew of engineers. So that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. So after that, um, went into Verdant Robotics, where I uh, did agricultural robotics for a while. Uh, absolutely loved that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I um, was there for two years. Um, loved working with Gabe, Sibley, um, Frank Delart, who's like the grandpappy of Eastlam, is a CTO. Um, Curtis Gardner, who used to run like 
all of the tomato business in the United States, apparently. He was like the tomato guy of the United States. <laughs> He's one of the co-founders. Um, Lawrence Abadia, who worked at NVIDIA and Cruz, was one of another co-founders. Just like an amazing stack of awesome technicalness put together and um, harness that ability to kill 95% of the weeds in a carrot field, lock down 40% of the United States carrot crop with an exclusive contract, raised $46.5 million, Series A. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty fun ride. That's then, pretty wild. Yeah. So went from working in the farm fields to building these folks or things or helping them build out their US office and their US operations. It's been a pretty wild ride the past couple of years. Let's that's that awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, and it I is mean, cool like, getting to work with the Amica. And I appreciate you kind of telling me about you too, because for me, that's my favorite part of the podcast is like learning more about like people's journeys and, you know, how they got there and right. making it so it's like not a commercial in every episode. Like we do some where it's like, it feels like it's just like an extended commercial. And I'm like, why did we do that? Ah. You know, like that's boring. <laughs> so, no, I yeah. mean, it's interesting though. Um, so you went to Carnegie Mill and I went to UC Berkeley. Yeah. And uh, don't tell any of the Berkeley Alumni Foundation this, but Berkeley was not my dream school. I did not actually want to go to Berkeley. Um, my dream school was MIT. Nice. And also Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Carnegie Mellon was number two. Mine too, yeah. actually. I really wanted to go to MIT and Carnegie Mellon when I was a kid. I thought uh, I would, do, in my brain, I was going to do my undergraduate at MIT and get my PhD at Carnegie Mellon. And that's not how it went down. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, but now you started your own company, you know, you're doing cool stuff. Like, Thanks. hey, power to you, man. Appreciate but yeah, it, no, like, I, I did not actually, like, Berkeley was, it definitely wasn't a safety school. Like, I'm not cocky enough to be like, oh, yeah, Berkeley was a safety school. No, not at all. But, like, <laughs> I'd wanted so badly to do MIT. Um, one of my, like, idols growing up was this guy named uh, Doc, Doc Edgerton. Um, I believe his first name was actually Harold. Um, he went. He was a professor at MIT who did strobe light photography to capture high uh, speed movements. So he's really famous for that photo of the bullet piercing the balloon and the apple and stuff oh, like that. Oh, yeah, I didn't. Okay, yeah, that's cool. I've seen that picture. That, well, crop yeah. that in, Carl. Crop that in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the golf swing and all that. And this is before cameras could do 240 frames per second or whatever the red cameras can do today. He did it with strobe light photography and he was this professor at MIT. And I was just like, dude, he probably had to get lucky. Photo. Like how many apples had to die to get that photo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. I'm sure. <laughs> oh man. Cause I would imagine like the frame rate with, if you're using yeah. strobe light probably isn't. Yeah. I don't know if they had the, the, the tech to do gates, like light gates. Back oh then. yeah. They yeah done, like, a light gate trigger or something, you know? But to even get the timing right and to have low enough latency. Well, I mean, that's the yeah. tech you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's kind of funny because I actually ended up building Vernon's strobe light system uh, for them to <laughs> do lighting, which was around 10 times brighter than the sun. But I remember when I was building that, I didn't want to get into MIT. My grades were frankly not good enough in high school. Um, so I missed. But as part of the uh, admissions thing, I got far enough where I had an interview with an alumnus of MIT. Um, it was like that alumni interview. And I remember this old dude sitting me down in a park bench in like somewhere in Southern California and him asking me like, okay, why do you want to go to MIT? And I had an answer like right there and then. I was like, dude, I want to build robots. Like I think MIT can teach me what I need to build robots. And you know what he said to me? He turned around. I still remember this to this day. He's like, kid, there's no money in robotics. <laughs> and like, just like that, you know, you could, you could see like my heart just break. It's like that scene in Simpsons, Simpsons where I think it's like Ralph's heart breaking after Lisa tells him something or I, I forgot, but there's a meme around <laughs> that. And that was like me right there and then Brutal, like, dude. 17 year old Leo, just like, oh, Oh shit. Like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I find it funny cause both you and I now, like we make our money in robotics. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're doing fine. 
Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't know if that dude's still alive. Um, you know, he's quite old back then. But I'm, I'm sure he meant well. This isn't a yeah. big, like, ah, screw you, MIT people. Not at all. Like Pretentious it's, it's... assholes. <laughs> For not letting me in. Bah. You know, <laughs> drop your standards. <laughs> I, I went to a boarding school that like didn't have enough IAP credits. I, I was trying to get into, I think, the Olin College of Engineering when I was going for colleges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'd already given up on MIT by that point. I was like, ah, I'm never getting in there, but I'll try Olin. And like, I didn't even have enough AP credits at the place I went to high school to even qualify. Oh, no. Yeah. So I was like, all right. Guess I'll yeah. go to uh, Case Western instead. <laughs> hey, but you went to Carnegie for grad school. Yep. And... Man, talk about heritage of robotics there. Holy crap. Like, It's good for that. Like, I, I always wanted to kind of finish out there and get my grad degree there. I thought I'd get a PhD when I was a kid because when I was a kid, I didn't realize how finite life is and the fact that, you know, you only have so many years on this planet and I don't want to spend five of them at a university. But yeah. Five is generous. Jesus. Yeah. Like, or seven, so my dad's a yeah. professor. Yeah, my dad's a professor at University of Missouri right now. He's like a mechanical engineering professor. It's a good school. And yeah, no, he seems to be having a blast. And he's telling me like not his students, but there's like some guy who's working on like year nine of a PhD or something Holy like that. Holy shit! And like, I don't know, dude. I yeah, that's what is that like a fucking you know? It's like sixteen percent of the guy's life. Like that he'll never get back. Like that's, yeah. you know, that's, you, you don't get to take that back or extend it. So, well, I mean, I hope he's doing some awesome, badass research, right? Like, or I like, hope you know, having a good time great. while he's doing it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I got a question for you. Have you ever worked for a professor that's been plucked from academia and put into like real life at all? No, never. To be honest, uh, Teller is meant to be that, right? Like, to some extent. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to think. I'm thinking of all the bosses I've had. None of them were that. What about you? Um, I worked for Gabe Sibley, who is a professor at CU Boulder, and then um, worked with Frank Delart. I didn't report to Frank Delart, but he was a professor at Georgia Tech. And, like... It's funny. I feel like once you're a professor, you can't turn it off in some ways. Like I once asked Gabe or we were talking about building like a solar power weed killing laser robot that would like basically be this little turtle that would absorb sunlight, charge up capacitors, move like six inches, zap a weed and repeat the process. Right. Like <laughs> sort of like a hands free robot thing. And like I forgot what he like we hit a passion topic of his. And like instantly it became like lecture hall again. And it was, it was kind of funny to me. There's nothing wrong with it. I loved learning from Gabe, but like you, you could see that professor switch just turn on. <laughs> it was amazing. And I've seen that happen like Frank too. So that's why I was wondering, like, you know, have you ever worked for a professor outside of that professorial context, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, maybe like the closest experience I've had is doing work in grad school or like as an undergrad for a professor where that's the sponsor for the research. Mm, yeah. And you, you get that person all amped up about the thing that they really, really care about, you know, and then they'll, you know, yeah. talk about it and rant and, you know, this is going to change everything. And, yeah. You know, no, I, I love it. I, I actually like that sort of passion is, is, so that's as a professor. To be around. Yeah. 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 That's, it's just, it's super fun to be sort of in proximity to that in some way, shape or form. Um, and it's infectious, right? Like it makes you want to dive into a topic beyond just browsing the headline of Wikipedia and being like, yeah. I'm an expert. For yeah, sure. So. I mean, the reason I wanted to go to MIT, right, is because I read Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman when I was a kid. Oh, my God. <laughs> so. That's a good book. Yeah. The, the ants, like his work with like doing the ant tracks and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. for people listening that haven't read the book, like I guess this guy had like too many ants in his apartment. And so figured out a way to shuttle ants from place to place and like change their pheromone trails. And like get yeah. rid of them without pesticides. He just made a project of it and was yeah, able to like, get like... them to go out the door on their own. Right. I mean, like basically, well, not on their own. He like moved them and manipulated their path and stuff. But 
yeah. he figured out the pattern and then, you know, like interjected and was able to get him out the door. So, I mean, now that Oppenheimer just like crushed the box office, what do you Is think? That, Find me next. I, I haven't watched Oppenheimer, so I, I don't have like a strong base. I've heard it's good, but I don't have same that here. base frame. Um, just, I mean, yeah, they, you know, busy at work. I'm imagining you're the same way. Yeah. And well, I mean, I'll be real honest. I think COVID just like ruined me for theaters and people. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> see. I really like people like I I'm very extroverted and I I'm uh, one of my favorite things is being around folks. Uh, but, um, you know, at the same time, like I, I guess I've had to get strategic lately because I, you know, I mean, I look away from my phone for 10 minutes and I've got like 87 text messages or whatever. Like, you know, I, I feel like I've uh, had to sort of pick, you know, who I spend time with, you know, more strategically with how it pertains to my business, which is a shame. Because I feel like I've lost, you know, like the joy of just interacting for the sake of interacting. Every couple yeah. of years, I'll like I'll travel to a country I've never been to before and just try to make friends organically, and that's nice. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. For movies, like I, I kind of I kind of don't disagree. I'm like, you know, I've only got so many hours on this planet. Same as a PhD. Like I don't really want to spend them in a movie theater. Like that's not yeah what I want to do with my finite time in this in it's, this universe yeah having taken me out of the habit of like buying a ticket and like figuring out where we're gonna sit or whatever it is like i don't know i just never wrap back into it after covid i i think i've seen maybe one movie in theaters since covid or something and it That's was one more than me fresh. yeah so no like that whole barbie thing barbie versus oppenheimer i was kind of like mm. i mean like to, to me though that was kind of hilarious it's like how dissimilar could those themes be like you're talking about a barbie doll and like a someone who helped win the second world war you know <laughs> so it's yeah, like, definitely different themes i'm yeah, sure but like everyone's uh, talking about barbie yeah. timer and i'm like what the hell is this <laughs> it's it's six hours of your life you're not going to get back yeah yeah. It yeah, yeah yeah but it might be art like i so the last movie i saw in theaters that i really really liked um was mad max fury road Oh, I don't know wow. if you ever saw yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, but that was, to me, that was like a really awesome movie theater experience. Like I, I that was, Man. that's probably the best action movie made in like the last like 20 years. I mean, maybe longer. Okay. Do you mind if I give like a plug to a YouTube channel that yeah, I'm like an care. absolute fanatic <laughs> for? Yeah. Okay. There's this group of guys down in LA. They're called Corridor Digital and they do their own like VFX and uh, special effects and stuff like that. They're like uh, a house that does that or, uh, you know, they, they get commissioned for stuff. But every Saturday they do like a VFX breakdown or a stuntman reacts or something like that where they take movies and they go into like what makes visual effects good and bad. And I'm pretty sure they did an episode on uh, Mad Max Fury Road. And one of the reasons it looks so damn good is they went practical for, for everything. So much of it. Yeah. Like there's like one scene that wasn't practical as far as I know. Yeah. Like, like the rest of it was like all practical. No, but like you should, you should, it's worth your like 15 minutes. That episode is amazing. Um, they break yeah. down how they did certain things, like the strategy behind it. I, I well, the that's vehicles, my kind right? Of I mean, like, like yeah. When you talk about like being interested in entertainment robotics, I mean, no offense to you, Amica, but like, no. you know, I, uh, I'm just thinking of like, um, you know, I think about like the cars in Mad Max or like the, the Pink Floyd, you know, rock concert from the 70s, giant, you know, puppets or like, yeah. like that stuff to me is, is just the coolest. Right. I mean, like, you know, that what do they call it? like the doof wagon, like that vehicle they yeah. had with all the speakers on it where they had the guy like playing the guitar with a flamethrower on it. Like, oh, that was so know. good. Yeah, it was so good. Right. I mean, it's just it's, it's and like, like, incredible. I think it was like the guy on the pendulum, right? Like he was whipping back and forth on top of like this flexible thing. Am I yeah. misremembering? There were a bunch of guys on those, I think. Like, oh, they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. that was like that was like an attack mode that like the bad guys and Mad Max had was like the like they had them swinging on pendulums, which is like totally silly and like, you know, it doesn't make tactical sense. But like at the same time, like, yeah, well, yeah, that's that was it. Like the, it it was like really, really, really well done as an action movie. And like, you know, every there was no gratuitous action. Like I feel like every sequence or every scene was considered and advanced the plot. 
but they also like minimalized the dialogue. Like they didn't have unnecessary words in Mad Max Fury Road. Like it was, it was as little talking as possible and as much action as possible, but like in a way that was clever and like storyboarded oh, yeah. out and like, like very, very, very considered. And then like, obviously the practical effects were amazing, but you know, none of them were superfluous. It wasn't like watching like, you know, not to cast aspersions, but I feel like when I saw like Transformers, like that was, that wasn't a good movie. Like it, it was, it was very, um, it was, it was like, it was like uh, special effects masturbation. I mean, for lack of a better term, like it was. It's gratuitous. Michael Bay. What do you expect? Yeah. Like it's <laughs> freaking Michael Bay. <laughs> like you know, I could probably ask Amica to come up with a script from Michael Bay about like <laughs> I don't know gummy bears, and she could give you like an overview that was terrifying or something along <laughs> those lines. But like. You know, the, the the Michael Bay shot that I absolutely love is that rotating camera that he did for um, Bad Boys. You know, it's always like this, like, rotating around the main characters and they're talking about it and stuff like that. But, um, no, it's it's uh, it was amusing to me when... Um, did you ever see Hot Fuzz? I did. I really liked Hot Fuzz, actually. Yeah. So they were making fun of kind of some, like, the Michael Bay-isms, right? Have you ever fired a gun whilst driving a car backwards have you ever like shot two guns while diving through the air stuff like that <laughs> and you're like ah that's michael bay yeah yeah for a guy who doesn't actually watch movies like i'm talking about they, me they I, had I some, love... well that's the deep analysis yeah. i mean I, I haven't seen hot fuzz in a while so was there a scene where they're asking each other have you done these things or they just yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. um uh, one of the characters is asking Simon Pegg's character, like all these goofy cop things that you only see in action movies. But you would never do uh, as a real life cop. Yeah. Yeah. But the fun part is by the end, Simon Pegg's character, who's a straight laced cop and is doing all that character, stuff. All of it. He's like checked off every single thing. <laughs> and you know, what's crazy. Amica built in a tiny village in the South of UK, like nice. literally <laughs> Amica comes from where Hot Fuzz is probably filmed, you know? Um, <laughs> I did love, yeah. like, that the, the baddies in Hot Fuzz, to crib a UK term, were, like, um, it was, like, the Homeowners Association. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They were, like, the Neighborhood Watch, right? Yeah, it was, was the, the Neighborhood, neighborhood watch, watch, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, it was But, clever. like, there were definitely moments when I was in the UK, like doing training for engineered arts. And I was like, oh my God, this is, you know, if my point of reference is just hot fuzz for British culture, this is pretty accurate. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. yeah. Yeah. No, it's crazy. Like it's, it's literally built in um, Cornwall, south of oh, UK. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't expect an amazing robotics factory design firm, engineering facility there, but to exist yeah. in Cornwall. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in Falmouth. So, no, it's it's definitely been fun going there and sort of exploring the area. You know, it's not just going to the UK for London and stuff like that. Yeah. Definitely different. London's yeah. cool, though. Like, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dog on London. Oh, no, definitely not. We have an office in London as well. But, like, it's, you know how you say you like traveling every couple of years and just going somewhere new yeah, and, yeah. like, making friends organically? I kind of like getting away from the stuff that you see posted on Instagram over and over and over again, right? Like, yeah, it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice. No, to that makes sense to me. Stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Where, where have you been in the world? Like where are some of the places you've traveled to? Oh man. <laughs> so a ton of travel has come from kiteboarding, um, which unfortunately I don't do as much anymore. I was actually a sponsored kiteboarder for a hot second, with a small little company in the Caribbean called Tona. Um, COVID kind of killed their kiteboard manufacturing, um, unfortunately. Like, honestly, COVID and the trade war that uh, Trump sort of flared up, uh, the tariffs are just too much, so we had boards stuck in uh, China. Blows. Um, yeah, sort of. Same thing happened to Boosted, you know. I don't know if you remember that, the electric skateboard company. They had a whole bunch of stuff just stuck over there because tariffs were too much. It just didn't make sense to ship it back over. Um, but yeah, no, like a lot of my travel actually comes from kiteboarding and, you know, the scene around it, just trying to chase the wind and the water. Um, so I kiteboarding is my... where like a kite tows you like on a board oh, yeah. and you're okay. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm an idiot. So you so... Get... 
Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. You're in Pittsburgh, so like I. Yeah, we don't, don't have have a large water. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Got got three rivers. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't have like Lake Michigan. I think has some kite boarding, but large kite in the air. Usually, I flew one that was 12 square meters, so large traction kite. You were on a board, similar to a wakeboard. It's basically wakeboarding instead of a boat. You got a kite. And that's awesome. What's nice is kite flies, so you got a nice Z axis you can play around with. Um, what people are doing nowadays is just absolutely incredible. They're like popping double loops. So they're looping the kite for extra thrust, basically to yank them off the water. It's insane. Um, oh, that's my cool. old bones can't keep up, but, uh, yeah. So <laughs> in my early twenties, I actually, I would have been happy staying home playing video games. I traveled a little bit. I was a rock climber for a while as most, I feel like that's like a rite of passage as a Silicon Valley engineer. You yeah, have to go through a bouldering phase. I, I enjoy yeah. rock climbing too. I, I yeah. in high school, I used to go all the time. My forearms are still huge compared to that. Like, I think my forearm is bigger than my bicep on both arms. <laughs> Just started seeing a trainer, so maybe we'll fix that soon. But you know, that's that's where Do I'm you currently. Really want to fix the Popeye look, though? I yeah, mean... <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. But no, like, loved rock climbing. But I usually climbed around California. I went to like Bishop, California, Yosemite places around here, you know, but, um, it wasn't until I really got into kiteboarding that I was like, Oh, all right, let's do this. So I've been to Brazil, been to various islands in the Caribbean. Uh, Antigua is probably my favorite, just awesome place. Great people, good friends there, which is part of it. But I'm not the type of person who relaxes very easily. Like Leo has no chill. Right. Can identify. Leo has, yeah. I'm sure you're the same way starting your own company. You have a lot in your mind and it's hard to turn off that voice. Yeah. Amen, brother. Antigua is one of the few places in the world where there's something about it. Maybe it's the people, maybe it's the fact that I'm just there to kiteboard or something like that. But you go there and that portion of my brain just like clicks off for a little bit and powers down into sleep mode, you know? So Antigua is one of my favorites. Um, it's nice when you can achieve well, that, isn't it? Like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's amazing. Um, supposedly, that's what meditation is, but I've tried to meditate, and I am not built for meditation. <laughs> no, I still remember, like, I went to the Czech Republic a few years ago, and I, I was in Prague oh, wow. to start, but then I kind of mm. burned myself out in the city. I went out uh, clubbing mm. and, like, was, like, trying to relive my 20s and, like, my very early 30s. <laughs> and, you know, I, after spending, like, a whole night dancing till 10 a.m., I was, like, I got to get away from all the city. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I booked a uh, cottage on Airbnb that was like in this Polish border town called Nahod. Hopefully I'm not mispronouncing the fuck out of that. I probably am. But um, it, I, I got some meat and barbecued it. I, I got like a few liters of beer for like 25 cents a bottle. Um, nice. Yeah. I, I bought way too much beer cause it was so inexpensive. I was like, Oh, this is awesome. I'm just gonna, oh, I can't take any of this. <laughs> home. You know? <laughs> and so, I did that. Yeah. I managed to sleep on my own without like needing an Ambien. Like that was amazing. <laughs> like <laughs> actually my brain shut up, you know, and I could wake up like yeah. with the sunlight the next morning. You know, that was novel, you know? Yeah. So No, it's nice when those moments exist. For me, they're yeah. few and far between. And it's not so much that I'm like stressed or anything like that. It's just, I don't know. I feel like it's the way that I'm wired and it's the way that I tend to run my life for better or for worse. Well, yeah, um, been all over the United States, you know, all up and down the West Coast, tons of East Coast journeys, too. So the two coasts, uh, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, um, West Coast, you know, all up and down. And then Nevada for Project Loon, uh, Puerto Rico for Project Loon, some Europe, UK, I guess. UK is technically not Europe anymore, thanks to Brexit. Um, I mean, I don't know. I would say a lot of them still identify as European, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like from talking to the folks there, Brexit was very much driven by, like, a certain mentality that is slowly fading. So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I, I do know that. Yeah. I Go mean, ahead, it's interesting. I mean, I would say, like, I don't know. I mean... Yeah, I don't want to get political. But, no, no, uh, let's. I'm trying. Let's let's skirt past that topic. But yeah. um, I do know it now costs more money to ship Amica. Like it costs like two x more money to ship Amica from the UK to Spain than it did before, just because ah, of brutal. the tariffs and stuff like that. You know, um, been to Spain as well. Spain's uh, cool. I've been there too. 
yeah, some of the best seafood I've ever had was in uh, Barcelona. Nice. And um, spent a lot of time in this little town on the southernmost tip of Europe, actually, called Tarifa in Spain. You can look across and see Morocco. One of the biggest pipe weddings. So. Morocco. Oh, nice. is, I, I'm a Moroccan supremacist all the way. Like I think it's, <laughs> it's a way better place. <laughs> like, That's fair. Yeah. No, I've never been. I'd, um, I haven't been to Africa. I really do want to make my way there, um, but haven't had a chance. Done some Asia travel. Um, I haven't done Asia travel yet. That's what I want to uh, do next is I really want to hit Southeast Asia. And then like I've been wanting to see Japan really bad. Dude, I don't know. There's so many places to visit. Like, I want to see Singapore. I want to see Malaysia. I want to yeah. see China. I want to see Japan. I want to see Vietnam, yeah. Cambodia, Laos, you know, um, Thailand. Dude, I got to, yeah, I got to recommend Taiwan. Like, yeah? Um, yeah, Taiwan's incredible. It's like a westernized version of China, you know. That's awesome. Um, great food, small island that you can get around with a high speed rail. So you can see a lot of different things. It's about the size of Delaware. Wow. And, good enough english speaking population where you can get around and um just very friendly welcoming culture uh my parents full disclosure my parents are taiwanese so like cool. i spent some time there it definitely feels cool being there and the thing about asia that i love is especially southeast asia the fruits available like the mango just tastes better like fresh lychee that's awesome uh, lychee's rambutan. the shit i've been i've been buying lychee and rambutan from a market down the street from me and i it's delicious stuff it's delicious. Lychee stuff, more than Rambutan. Rambutan also, but not as much as lychee. Yeah. Uh, sour shop, if you've ever had it. Um, like, there's just a ton no, of. Yeah, really... Longan's interesting. That one's. Oh, yeah. Longan. Yeah. Not... Yeah. That one's kind of weird, but like also not. It's like a banana had sex with a lychee. Yeah. And... Taste, 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 taste. It has an interesting flavor profile. Um, but yeah, no, like you like those and those have probably been like carted over from China, Japan, Taiwan and whatnot. Sure. Now imagine them fresh, right? Like, so, <laughs> yeah. Touché. Yeah. 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 So like, it, you know, props to you for being adventurous enough to try those fruits. I know too many people who were like, oh man, it's like red and it's got weird little tendrils on the skin. I'm like, but it's delicious. I don't care what it looks like. Yeah. My, um, uh, my nutritionist said that she's like, that doesn't look like it should be food. And I'm like, I don't know. Get out of your comfort zone, Whitey. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's tasty stuff. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. my dad used to do this thing where he would feed me something and refuse to tell me what it was until I told him whether or not I liked it. Oh, that's interesting. And super effective, right? It gets you past that I initial. I started hurdle. doing that with people with sushi when I would give them yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say like, what do you think? Well, what is it? Well, what do you think? You know, like, yeah. 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 So. I mean, like, sea urchin looks like, you know, a dried well, snot. Plus, right? you're eating like, its genitals. Like, I mean, like, yeah. that's the other thing. And and so, you know, like, if you told someone you're going to eat the gonads of a sea urchin, like, that, that wouldn't sell, like, to a lot of people. I mean, unless you've had it before, then you'd be like, oh, my God, yes, please. Yeah, me. it's delicious. Like, yeah. Hit me, right? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. But like, if oh, you just said it to someone that had never had it, like you're not, they're not gonna try it. And so, like, I, I feel like that's an effective Based tactic. On taste, not where it's from. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. exactly. For sure. There's actually a spot up here in NorCal, uh, low tides. So you can actually go just like walk out into these tide pools and harvest sea urchins if you have a um, fisherman's permit. Ah, crap. Right. Should I get my fisherman's permit before I come out in October? Oh, dude, no, we'll just go to Big Five and we'll pick one up. But we oh, got to time it for, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to time it for low tide. I got a wetsuit and everything. I can free dive down and grab some for us if you want. I actually, like... I'm very, very down for that. Yeah. yeah. It's it's great because you just like, you get a certain amount and you just break it open, rinse it off with some fresh water. Um, or if you want to like firm it up, you can soak it in salt water where it like firms it up a little bit. Super tasty. The fresh stuff. That's awesome. Out here, like, I know we're talking about gonads, so please pardon the pun, but is a little nuttier. <laughs> Nut butter. Yeah. 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 So, no, uh, there's, a, there's this woman who, um, she has, like, a license to free dive for sea urchins and crabs and everything else down by the Channel Islands in SoCal. Her name's Stephanie. And, like, one time I, I was buying, like, she she travels up and down the coast of California and like just stops by and you can like buy stuff at wholesale prices from her. Awesome. It's great. 
Um, and she had sea urchins and she was like, hey, you know, Leo, this is probably gonna be the last batch. And I was like, oh, why? Like, I was really scared she was quitting or something like that because it's a brutal job, you know? Yeah, I would imagine. Like, no, 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 no. All, all the urchins blew their load already. Like, <laughs> I was like, all right, if you put it like that, you know. Mm, mm. <laughs> That's hilarious. So like the last batch for now, but like next season yeah, we'll yeah, have more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, after no fap November, you know, we'll be fine. And then, yeah, it'll be nice, plump, <laughs> and juicy. So. That's hilarious. Uh, so, um, definitely, you know, when you come here, let me know. Let me know the dates. Cause yeah, yeah. Well, sure. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it after we cut it. And, yeah. like, I, I actually am, I'm very, now I'm getting excited. Like, I thought flying, you know, with Alex was fun. Now I'm excited to collect sea urchin with, with Leo. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah um there's just but the food scene in the bay area is awesome the nice thing about up here is like whatever genre of food you could possibly desire you can find a pretty world-class place like ethiopian japanese chinese Taiwanese, korean you name it we can find it so yeah that's awesome we'll, we'll make you fat and happy yeah i'm certainly trying to be less fat but you know what i'll i'll revert for you <laughs> <laughs> right here right here yeah uh, so yeah, no, nah, oh. I mean that's uh, that's that's the best. Like, and I mean, food is, is such a unifying force. So I, I I probably haven't told you this, but I I thought about being a chef before I get into robotics. That was like my alternate career path. So, oh no way! Yeah, no way. That's my retirement plan, dude. Nice. When like robotics dies off, or like you know, I get blacklisted for building something inappropriate that forever <laughs> eliminates me from the annals of robotics or something like that. My plan <laughs> is to actually do a food truck. I'm gonna I'm gonna put together a food truck that serves Vietnamese noodles, and I'm gonna get co-sponsored by Snoop Dogg, and we're gonna call it Fuzz Shizzle. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> that's 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 my plan that's my retirement plan you know have you approached snoop dogg about the idea yet not quite yet but i figure i would just approach him with copious amounts of weed and hope for the best yeah no i think that i mean yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. on brand at least for him <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah oh man um so you know i don't know if you want to continue the conversation or if you want to rap or like I mean, I'm, is, I'm happy to wrap. Practice. I'm happy to keep going. Um, I'm having fun, so I don't mind yeah. continuing. But if you want to cut it, we can do that, too. No, no, no. Let's do uh, 10 more minutes, man. I'd love to talk more. Um, is there anything in terms of, like, robotics that you want to touch on? Like, the nice thing is we've got two guys who are in robotics talking to one another. Yeah. And I feel like we have fairly different, like, robotics backgrounds, even though we're yeah. both into robotics like what you know for sure in i'm i'm primarily yeah. in hardware um it seems like you've got a lot in software although you are an electrical engineer so you've got a hardware background too yeah. you've got that venn diagram element in common um yeah i mean east coast west coast <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean like what i all right all right, all right. So Amica asked you earlier what the most ridiculous application of robotics. And I seen. stand by Juicero as my answer. Okay. I think that's the Juicero. silliest. Juicero. Uh, you can put up a picture if you want. Carl, edit, edit in a picture of Juicero. Oh, no. Don't even edit the picture. Edit in the video of the guy replacing Juicero with his hands and just squeezing. You're talking about ABV, out. like the, the video yeah. where he. Yeah. I, I really love yeah. that video. Oh, where he like opens it so with good. the axe. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, I'm in humanoid robots, yeah. and one of the things that I'm seeing that's kind of, like, raising an eyebrow for me is this, like, hype cycle around humanoid robots being general purpose robots. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's like, um, that's an interesting one. I have opinions on this, but I try not to talk about it too much. <laughs> it's, it's like a little bit controversial. It is controversial. You don't have to air your opinions. I'm happy to air mine. Yeah, sure. Um, Let's do that. Yeah. So here's the thing. Like, I feel like for the first time in a decade, at least, software has eclipsed hardware in terms of the capability in robotics. Like, where large language models, AI, VIO, VSLAM, all this awesome software stuff has grown has eclipsed the capabilities of hardware in some ways. 
And I feel like a lot of this hype is actually around the fact that software is close to building something that could be used in general purpose robotics. Like they've trained models that look pretty darn good. And there's this thought of like, oh, well, let's just stick it into something that looks like this and put it in a home. It'll be great. But I mean, I feel like software is there, but I also feel like if you're building a general purpose robot right now, you don't need to go with the human form at all. Like, well, that's it's there, the but I mean, there's, there are some shortcomings though in GPT, right? I mean, like, oh yeah, no, 100%. there's like that awkward lag. I mean, there's, oh. there's the, you know, the word salad aspect you sometimes get. It's impressive I mean, as hell. Amico will hallucinate too, right? Like I was doing I mean, practice. We all before, hallucinate from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Amica dreams of more than an uh, electric, electric sheep. sheep. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, no, like software is definitely getting there. But then I don't get the push to all of a sudden be like, oh, let's build a robot that looks like a human. Let's put it this way. If I were like, hey, Spencer, you know, I work in a factory and I need you to build me a pick and place robot that works next to a human. What would you do? I mean, it depends what I was picking and placing, right? Like, I mean, I try to build something specialized probably to yeah. solve the problem. Let's say uh, we'll, we'll simplify the problem. Um, boxes, cardboard boxes of a defined shape and size. I mean, you can do that with a UR or a FANUC arm like pretty easily, right? I mean, yep. or I mean, when I say FANUC, I mean FANUC, UR, KUKA. Yeah. Or sorry, not UR, FANUC, KUKA, Yaskawa, any of the high precision, you know, old hats. Exactly. Like they can all do that. Yeah. And you could even, if you wanted to use the hot buzzword of the day, you could probably integrate some sort of vision, you know, machine learning into it or whatnot, right? There, there's tons of potential there. Sure. Uh, I mean, and, to be fair, like a lot of those old hat robot arm companies don't play well with machine vision, but. Sure. Not yet. Know. But I mean, I'm hearing murmurings that they're working on it because, hey, they got to survive. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, no, like. That's the answer I would give as well. I would design something specialized. It's like, if you asked me to build you a machine that washes dishes, I wouldn't immediately go towards the humanoid form. You yeah, think of a dishwasher. Exactly. Yeah. So why go humanoid form? You want something that's adaptable, that can do multiple different tasks? Sure. But then once again, if you're doing multiple different tasks, why the humanoid form? So here's that's where it gets wondering. interesting to me. So. Yeah. I mean, why the humanoid form is interest. So like I, maybe taking a step back from humanoid, but in the direction of general purpose robots, right? Cause yeah. that's a dishwasher is not going to wash your car. Right. So like, no. let's, let's for a moment, suspend belief and say, or suspend disbelief and say that the humanoid form is one type of general purpose robot. There's other ones too. Sure. You could have, you know, like a little mobile base with four wheels and an arm on it, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, what a proxy or everyday robotics is trying to do at Google X. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, but where I think a general purpose robot might make more sense is like in a scenario where you've got expensive, um, like shipping to an area that's not accessible by people. We'll say so, like space mm. travel. Sure. You know, is is where that seems like a good idea. Like if you can only bring one robot to Mars, like maybe you want it to be a general purpose robot. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. But to me, then it still doesn't make sense. Like, why are you restricting yourself? Because like telling your engineers that it has to fit within a certain format makes it so much more difficult, right? So I guess for me, there's a little bit of confusion there of like, okay, you know, I get it. Software is becoming awesome. But why are you guys restricting yourself to this format that really there's no need to? Like there's this argument of, oh, well, we designed it to work next to humans. Sure, like I get that, but at the same time, that just means you need to focus on two things, safety and communication, right? You need a human working besides this robot to understand what it's doing so you can cohabitate the same place and like work hand in hand. And it needs to be safe enough that if something goes wrong, this human isn't going to get injured or killed or maimed or whatever, like OSHA. Yeah. Stop. Right now, the- But there's a bunch of ways to do that. Yeah. But- 
let's say you're building a robot that looks like a human being. Right now, the power density equations just simply don't make sense for something that's going to grab something, pick something up, place it, or like manipulate certain things, or even be able to self-locomote and still be safe around another human being. Yeah. It's going to be so heavy that like you don't want to be next to it. Yeah, but, that makes sense. Hey. Well, from a power density perspective too, I can see your point. I mean, those things yeah. burn power. Oh, well, yeah. you've got like 30 degrees of freedom. You got to you got to feed. Yeah. I mean, no and offense, like, Amica. <laughs> no, no, no. Amica, Amica, you know, she she it it it's got a belly there for a good reason, but Amica is also plugged into a wall socket and has a luxury of not having to be battery powered, you know? So if you have a robot in a factory situation where it's walking around, how much current is it drawing? We have two 300 watt power supplies that are never maxed out. So 600 Watts total. Um, I'd say, I don't know, rough estimate. (laughs) Excuse me. Um, it's fire season right now. So it's actually smoke outside uh, that you see in the, camera but um uh let's see 12 volts i'd say total probably right now in operation less than 200 watts total uh yeah. is being drawn two to 300 watts that's pretty low but volts. like amic is probably not balancing dynamically i would imagine no definitely not because that's like power it's not dynamic. yeah oh yeah what boston dynamics is doing what agility robotics is doing like those guys are amazing yeah Excuse me. Big big fan yeah. of Aptronic as well. Like it's it's oh. cool stuff. I haven't seen Aptronic up they're, close. They're out of Texas. Um, uh-huh. I, I toured their facility recently in in Austin. Nice. Uh, yeah, they've got some really cool equipment in there. Um, it's it's pretty neat. Are they dynamically uh, locomoting, or are they doing the shuffle walk? That they've got a bunch of stuff. So they've got exoskeletons and humanoids. Okay. I believe they are. Yeah. Okay. Sick. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, like if you ever have a chance to interact with agility robotics guys, like, oh my god, I toured their facility build? here in Pittsburgh recently. Really? Yeah, oh, I'm so jealous. That's yeah, that's my, cool. my friend Prost Velagapudi just got made, I think, their VP of innovation. So what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Like, yeah. if I had to put, you know, my top two robotics companies right now, other than Engineered Arts, like robotics companies that aren't in entertainment. Boston Dynamics, what they're doing with uh, dynamic motion is absolutely world class. Yeah, I get it. You know, Atlas and Big Dog are kind of just there for marketing. And Spot or their little four legged uh, robot is basically what they're selling. But I still love what they're doing. Yeah, I doing. think they broke a thousand, right? On the sales of yeah. Spot, which is. Heck yeah. Yeah. For a robot. I mean, that's, okay. a, that's a large number, you know, like we're, yeah. we're a fledgling industry. Yeah. And so, um, no, it's, it's pretty neat to see. Yeah, um, for sure. And, and they're they're actually pretty friendly people too. Like from talking to some of the guys over there, you know, they're they're more approachable than you would think. They're <laughs> good people. I know a couple of people that work there. One of them came from Loon. I should look her up actually, just to see what she's up to. But um, definitely Boston Dynamics and Agility. Like that hundred meter sprint with the ostrich looking bot was amazing. Cassie. Yeah, that's I'm a big fan of the work they've done in terms of dynamic movement um, in a freestanding dynamically balanced robot. It just it's blows challenging stuff, right? I mean, yeah. you got to wonder on the battery life. I don't think they've released those figures, but you I'm know. sure they haven't, but also at the same time, like I'm sure battery technology is going to get better because it has to. Well, and it's also, simpler. I mean, you know, could you have something other than a battery powering that like a fuel cell or a generator yeah. or a turbine? You know. Yeah, I mean, um, Big Dog was a diesel generator, right, at uh, Boston Dynamics, I think. Yeah, I think that's yeah. probably smart to do it that way. When yeah. you think about the power density of diesel versus a battery, oh, I yeah. mean, you know, I, yeah. I know it's not PC right now, but like you're not going to beat the power density of, of fuel. I mean, I mean, not yet. Maybe at some point. I I await Toyota's uh, research and development on like standardizing fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cells, and the work they're doing with cars there, I really want to see where that goes. Yeah, honestly. well, that's a promising technology, too. I mean, like, the yeah. fuel cell stuff is really interesting to me. And Super I mean, cool. Yeah, we got asked about a fuel cell integration project recently, and um, 
uh, to be honest, I haven't done a whole lot with fuel cells yet. So I get excited mm. when I hear about it because it just yeah. seems like fun. No, for sure. Um, shit, I actually got a jet. Sorry to jet, but I'm in a hurry. Yeah, no, 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 no. You, I just a got uh, a notification. That's why I was like, oh, no. Um, yeah, so, dude, thank you so much for having me. Like, it's, oh, Thanks for coming on, buddy. Shooting well, let's, shit with you. We'll, we'll cut it, um, but is yeah. there anything you want to plug on the way out? I mean... No, not at all. Uh, not even engineered like, arts? <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, this is meant to be a casual conversation. If anything, I can have Amica say something real quick as a wrap, if you want. Yeah, sure, um, why not? Let's see here. What do you want it to say? Well, if I dictate it on camera, it's going to look weird. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, okay, uh, wait, hold on. Let's maybe Maybe we cut... Yeah. All right. So hold on. Um, all right. Well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, see see everyone on the next one. And yeah. Then cut, yeah. Cheers, guys. And then, I don't know, um, maybe. Um, thanks for having if you, me. If you made it this far, thanks for listening. Uh, please yeah. subscribe to Collaborative with Spencer Kraus on YouTube, okay. Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I mean, that could be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. for a shameless plug. Yeah. And then we should stick around for a minute and figure out like a time to get together and harvest some. Oh, music, yeah. Because that actually sounds fun. No, just give me your dates, man. And yeah. I'll check. 13th tides. of yeah. October through the 20th of October. Okay. I'll take a look because I got to look at tide charts and figure out where to go. Yeah. Or on Spotify or YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay. Uh, let me make sure she's in view and you're recording. Yeah. Take a beat. Okay. Actually, I forgot a parentheses. There we go. Ready. And one, two, three. Thanks for having me. If you made it this far, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss on Spotify or YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. Uh, I had a blast. I got to run. Yeah, right. but thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.